This is the first portion of the lecture on personality. Uh, this portion will cover only the parts on the on psychoanalysis and psychodynamic theories of personality. When we talk about psychoanalysis, we have to talk about Sigmund Freud, who's the father of psychoanalysis. Now, psychoanalytic theories uh, were essentially established by Freud. Um, Freud would often use uh, his ideas about the unconscious uh, and uh, to help explain why people are the way that they are. He also focused a lot on childhood. Freud believed that our personality was centered around three main concepts. The first is the id. Uh, according to Freud, the id's unconscious psychic energy constantly strives to satisfy the basic drives um, of human beings. Uh, he refers to this as the pleasure principle. It requires immediate gratification. And these basic needs, he said, were both violent and sexual. He said that part is entirely unconscious. It's unconscious psychic energy. At around four or five, he said that our superego develops where we begin to have uh, idealized uh, views of the world. And it focuses on how we ought to be. Maybe not necessarily how we are, but how we ought to be. And he said that the id and the superego are in a constant battle of trying to push their influence onto a person to make them who they are. For the superego, parts of it are internalized, therefore in unconscious, and parts of it are outside of us, meaning that we see the world for how it is. And then finally, in this battle between the id and the superego, we have the ego. And the ego uh, is essentially, they focus on the reality principle, which is the idea that it tries to satisfy the urges of the id while still maintaining the ideas of the superego. A good way to think about this would be that the id is that devil on your shoulder and the superego is that angel on your shoulder and the ego is the referee. Now the ego works in what we call the reality principle, meaning that it seeks to satisfy those urges of the id in realistic ways that still maintain the ideals of the superego. So for example, if you were upset at somebody and you're like, I just wanna kill them, that would be your id thinking. Obviously your superego knows that's wrong, but maybe the ego allows you to yell at them, for example, um, or maybe even uh, hit them, uh, which wouldn't be killing them and certainly would then satisfy the violent urges of the id while maintaining the we don't kill ideal of the superego. Freud believed that when we don't can't satisfy those, when there can't be a, uh, when there's always still a conflict between the id and the superego, and the ego can't satisfy that urge while maintaining the ideals of the superego, that's where we experience anxiety. Anxiety where we feel this kind of feeling of uh, that something is going to be wrong, but we can't put an idea on what it is. To combat anxiety, Freud says that we carry out eight distinct defense mechanisms. Actually, there are nine. I'm sorry. Uh, the first is rationalization. Rationalization is when we attempt to justify our own, uh, our own poor behavior. When we say, oh, it's okay because of this and it's okay because of that. Um, like uh, if somebody was working very hard in school, it's, oh, it's because I'm tired or maybe I don't need to um, because, you know, I can always do this if I really wanted to. Repression, we should remember from memory, is something that actually doesn't really happen very often. But repression is when we bury our, uh, our poor memories deep down inside uh, so that we can't, uh, can't think about them ever again. We now know today that repression is incredibly rare. Denial is when we refuse to believe that some painful reality is going to happen. Um, so if, for example, you have uh, a significant other who may be not interested in you, in you anymore and someone else tells you that, you say, no, I don't believe it. It's just not true. Projection is when we disguise our own threatening impulses 
by attributing them to others. If you had a significant other that was maybe cheating on you, you might accuse them of cheating instead. Reaction formation is where we take out our aggression uh, on somebody or something that's less threatening. So if, for example, a young child is really upset and they hit their stuffed animal, that is obviously less threatening. Regression is when we retreat to an earlier developmental stage or, or have a characteristic of an earlier developmental stage. So for example, when an adult throws a temper tantrum, which is obviously a characteristic of being a toddler, that would be a form of regression. Displacement is one of these good things, um, but displacement is when we shift these impulses on something that's less threatening. Oh, I'm really sorry. I totally missed, messed up reaction formation. And that's when we switch our unacceptable feelings into an acceptable one. That's reaction formation. I apologize. I've been going through this kind of quick. Displacement is when we carry out those aggressive, threatening actions on something that's less threatening. Sublimation is when we transfer something that's unacceptable into something that is acceptable. If somebody has a really aggressive tendencies, maybe they start taking a kickboxing class, for example. And then finally, identification is where we take on the characteristics of people who we find to have these negative attributes. Um, so an example of this would be uh, if somebody is um, being verbally abused, that then they become uh, a, verbal, a verbal abuser as well. Now, later on after Freud passed away, a lot of his uh, followers believed that there was a lot of value in the unconscious and in the ideas of childhood. However, they didn't feel that the focus on violent, sexual, unconscious energy was healthy or really accurate. Carl Jung uh, placed less emphasis on the social factors, but agreed that the unconscious played a powerful influence. Jung believed that we have a collective unconscious, which he called the common reservoir of images. Um, and we would have specific images, depending on the culture that we in, that we that we were in, called archetypes, um, that would that were derived from our universal experiences of all people. He said that the collective unconscious explains why, for many people, spiritual concerns are deeply rooted in people despite having different cultures, and why every one of these different spiritual ideas uh, have uh, very significant, uh, important figures. Alfred Adler also agreed that childhood was important, but they believed that the social tensions were crucial for personality formation and not uh, violent or sexual ones. Adler struggled a lot to overcome childhood illnesses and accidents. He said that much of our behavior is driven by efforts to conquer childhood inferiority feelings. He called this his inferiority complex. And this triggers our strivings for superior and superiority and power. Um, he said that uh, anxiety in our childhood, when we feel inferior, triggers our desire for love and security. Um, one of his... Uh, Adler's important people that he worked with, Karen Horney, said that uh, that it, Freud's ideas that women have weak super egos um, was not the same. And it's a, she said that it was a masculine bias. So how do we measure personality in the unconscious? Well, we use something called projective tests, which provide uh, either ambiguous images or ideas uh, about a person's unconscious. Now, one that's not really rooted a lot in science and certainly doesn't really have a lot of reliability and validity is the Rorschach inkblot test. The Rorschach inkblot test basically has you look at a series of inkblots and you identify an image. Now, based on that image, it represents, it's not necessarily exactly, but it represents the ideas from within your unconscious. Now, the Rorschach inkblot test has kind of been proven to be not so great, though it does uh, help some therapists uh, start with a lead to kind of where people are at mentally. 
However, one that does have a lot of reliability and validity towards a people's implicit motives, towards their unconscious motives and their unconscious ideas is the thematic apperception test or the TAT. In the thematic apperception test, people are given an ambiguous image uh, and they are asked to design a story or a situation for what's taking place in that image. Based on that story or situation that they talk about, it really reveals uh, unconscious motives uh, to, uh, to the therapist who can then use those unconscious motives to help someone understand how and why they're experiencing such things. This is where we're going to stop for this first section of the lecture.